welcome to NAPOD, where we provide NA speaker meetings and workshops in a podcast. We are an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us to be self-supporting by visiting NAPOD.xyz, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two in the virtual basket. If you're also an AA or have friends that are, please tell them about our other podcast, Sobercast. Sobercast features AA speakers and workshops in the same format as NAPOD. We upload a new speaker every day, and it's easy to subscribe by searching for Sobercast, that's two words, on any podcast player app or go to Sobercast.com. Enjoy the podcast, and thanks for listening. And like, you know, after a while of coming around and staying clean, you know, I realized that like, you know, a lot of the, that was my shit, you know, like basically those people were just doing their jobs, you know, that, you know, everybody wasn't really out to get me, you know, the things that I was doing was wrong, you know, and, but like what I really remember, realized after working a few steps and stuff was that like the biggest grudge that I had was against myself you know, for all this, all this stuff that, you know, like, it talks about in our text is like letting yourself down in your own eyes, you know, and, and, and from doing that over and over again, you know, I got, I held a grudge against myself, you know, and it was like, basically, it took me a long time to really start to believe in myself again after that, you know, uh, it took a lot of, uh, I guess, triumphs, you know, I, when I first got here, you know, I didn't like necessarily, like they say, like a lot of people say that, you know, when I seen the things happen in your lives, that it gave me hope, which it did, you know, but it wasn't until things started happening in my life that I really believed, you know, that this life is possible, you know, and I'm grateful for this life because, you know, by the time I came into this program, even though I was at a young age, I had lost all hope, you know, I wasn't, uh, you know, all the things that are happening now in my life are unbelievable to me. You know, it's like I'm living the dream. You know, they talk about living the dream. You know, it's like, um, you know, I had dropped out of school. You know, I was living place to place. I came in here because I caught some charges, you know. Uh, and basically, it was like you either go into a rehab or, you know, you go do six years in jail, you know. So it's like it was an easy, you know, it was an easy decision for me at that time, you know. And even then, you know, I didn't I didn't want to get clean, you know, that wasn't my idea. You know, I just wanted to like take care of my charges and like, you know, figure out how to sell drugs and not use them all, you know? It's like uh but after a while, you know, I came into a salvation army, you know, made that little five dollars a week for, you know, about ten months and like uh, you know, but it was like that was when I first got into a contact with myself, you know, and like I seen you know, as in an environment where men were praying and talking about their problems, their feelings, their emotions, you know, not everybody was there for the right reasons or whatever. But, you know, that also gave me a thing to look like is, okay, if you get with this or you get with that, you know, I've seen like, I think 250 people leave that program unsuccessfully, you know, and it let me know is like these people are the same people as me, you know, uh, but as far as like, you know, when they gave me this, they had given me one topic, then called me back five minutes later and gave me another topic, you know, and honestly, I like the first topic better, you know, but, but there must have been a reason for me to speak on this topic, otherwise it wouldn't be put in my place, you know, um, basically, um, you know, I had to think about it, like, what's a grudge, you know, where'd they get this from, you know, that's my first reaction, this is in the basic text, nobody heard nothing about no grudges, you know, and what I figured out is, like, it's a deep-seated resentment, you know, and, like, uh, that's held on for a long time, and the biggest thing that I have, like, once I got over the grudge that I had, like, with myself and God through, like, working, like, a fourth, fifth step, is, like, that, you know, I really have a grudge with my stepfather and my sister, you know, um, I guess like my stepfather raised me from the time that I could understand that he was my, what a father was, you know, from like six months, say, you know, um, and he's actually my sister's dad, you know, and like, you know, I, like, I guess till the time I was 13 when my parents separated and got divorced, you know, which was like, 
it was amazing to me is like you know he was very he wasn't really as much physically abusive although he was you know grab you by the ear slap you upside the head you know he never really beat me beat me but you know it was still you know the the way that he degraded me you know my mom and our family and the type of control that he had over our family you know was very painful to me you know and like uh even though when he, when my mother told me that he wasn't my dad you know i remember it like it was yesterday you know and it was like i knew it you know just because it was like i i never even though you know because me and you know i don't look like anybody in my family because my dad's full-blooded native american my real father you know and you know his uh he's my stepfather was you know like full-blooded german like six three you know thin you know and my dad's like short stout you know just like me you know it's like i got uh you know i was blessed to have my mother's personality because she has you know a better personality than either one of my fathers you know so it's like uh, i got my dad's looks and my mother's personality and people would kind of whisper about it when i was a kid but i never really grasped it and i never would have believed it if my mother didn't tell me you know what i mean because it's like when you lived and you've been programmed, okay, this is your dad, you never think twice about it. You know, I use his name, you know, everything. But my mother never, she must have known. She must have had some kind of thing because she never, she left the part where it says father blank on my birth certificate, on my original birth certificate. And like, you know, even after they separated, you know, he was still very emotionally abusive. You know, he liked to play like mind fuck games. That's what, you know, that's how my mom used to put it. You know, he liked to antagonize you and degrade you and like, you know, and, and, and amazingly enough, I got a lot of that shit too. You know, I, I got a lot of his characteristics in me, you know, um, basically like getting on people's nerves and just nagging after them, you know, until like a lot of times when I was a kid, I remember just thinking like, just go ahead and hit me and shut the fuck up. You know, I just like that, like getting that kind of thinking is like, you know, where someone just takes you to that point, you know, and I catch myself a lot of days doing it like that, un you know, subconsciously, you know, um, but like, you know, since then I've met my real father, you know, and it, it's really, I kind of have a resentment against him, but it wasn't his fault. You know, my mother never, you know, when he tried to claim me one time, she had said, okay, well, you're going to be doing, threatening them with child support and stuff. So I didn't really have a chance with him, but it's like very hard now. I mean, we're friends, but it's very hard to get a connection like that, I find. You know, I, I it's like, you know, like I call my mother and my grandmother like every week or two. But it's just like, you know, it's, you know, I went out there for a few weeks here and there. Uh, he lives in Arizona and it's just, you know, and I guess in a way I have a grudge with him for be, for him being the person that he was, you know, because why my mom didn't go with him, to, you know, to begin with was just because he was an addict, you know, first and foremost, just like me. And the fact that he couldn't be responsible, you know, my stepfather was the responsible person, you know, but he was an asshole, basically, you know, just total, complete, and still to this day, he's like that, you know, the world changes, and, you know, he just stays the same, you know, and like, in a way, I'm grateful, because when my parents got divorced, like, my mom and my stepfather, uh, she signed paperwork so that I wouldn't have contact with him, and he wouldn't have to pay child support for me, and, you know, at first, I was real disappointed, you know, his whole family disowned me, you know, when it was very painful for me. My mom actually shipped me to live with my grandma in California for a couple of years when they were divorcing to kind of keep me out of that, you know. And uh, it was ugly, you know. It was definitely ugly, and it hurt me a lot, you know. And, like, I had a lot of resentment and anger. I used a lot over that, you know. When I was a kid, you know, I lashed out, you know. All, a lot of that stuff was, like, once I started to do step work, I realized it was misplaced anger, you know, that I was angry at him and the situation and, you know, like, you know, why the hell did your family disown me? You know, like that, you know, that abandonment and stuff, you know, and I realized I had a grudge against his whole family. You know, when I was old enough, I remember seeing him in a parking lot somewhere and stepping to him, you know, and 
because, you know, he was like, you know, he's 6'3", I was like 5 nothing. you know, he wanted to pick on me, you know, it's like, all right, now what, you know, but it was like, uh, you know, none of that stuff never uh, changed it, but like, where the grudge is, like, I haven't had contact with him in like, you know, years, but I still, because my sister still has contact with him, he still affects our family, you know, and I, sometimes I think about it, like, you know, I mean, when I was younger, especially, like, after my parents separated, I definitely thought about taking him out, you know, at a young age. Like, let me just, you know, get a ski mask, you know, get a bat, hide in the bushes, whatever, you know. And, like, I had plotted many days and many different ways how to kill him, you know. And, like, if I wasn't clean today, you know, or, or like, that's why my mother and him really divorced, because it was coming to that point where one of us was seriously going to get hurt, you know, because he was going to hurt me or I was going to hurt him, you know, and it was coming where we started fist fighting more and it was getting to that point, but like, you know, and I put my sister through a lot too, you know, she's his daughter, you know, she always had preferential treatment, you know, he always, even though I didn't know it at the time, I could feel that he was favoring her, you know, and like, when my mom told me, I said, yeah, that, like, you know, yeah, I knew it, because he always favored her, you know, and it was like, you know, it just rocked my whole shit, you know, it's like I was living a lie for all those years, you know, from then on, really, is when I really started drinking, using, hanging out, from that point, you know, um, before that, I didn't really do it, you know, and, like, that was a, a major turning point in my life, but now, like, okay, I've been clean for eight years. I put my sister through a lot. You know, I used to practice wrestling with her. She was six, you know, six years younger than me. Throw her around, you know, like, pick on her. And I, and I did the same things that my stepfather did to me to her. You know, it was like definitely misplaced anger. You know, and like to this day, you know, our our relationship is very strange. You know, uh, and like what I figured out when I started looking at this topic is like, that I hold a grudge against her because of what her father is, you know, and it makes it that much harder for me is because she has like the same look and ideas as him, you know, she's like six foot tall, you know, blonde, straight hair, you know, she has the same look as him, you know, you could tell that she's his daughter, you know, and it's just like, and she's like real, I guess, like, right now, she's on a monetary kick, you know, she's that type, like, she's all, the way it's been is like that, I've always been, you know, the heart and soul in my family, you know, just like my mom, I always had that, that love, that passion, you know, I'm an artist, but she's always been that, you know, the excel person, you know, the person that, like, good in sports, good in school, you know, she always was trying to outdo me, and I never figured it out. But she got a grudge with me, too, just because it's like I am the person that I am. Because no matter how good she could do, I'm me, you know, and, I, and I'm an original person, you know. And, like, I definitely, like, to, to even today, she's still, like, I'll get something from my mom, whatever, you know, and she'll try to outdo me, you know. She'll try to buy something. But it's like when I see her, it just makes me, like, something about it. I it was It's so subconscious, though. It's like like when she starts getting into, like, you know, like, this is what I'm doing, you know, and, and it just gets me so bad, you know, and I want to argue with her, I want to, you know, even to this day, it's like only like the last couple years that I've been able to even like sit down and have a meal, you know, like Easter or whatever, you know, and I've been working steps, but there's just something about her that gets me, and it's the grudge against him, you know, and I figured that out, it's like that I'm holding this grudge against him, and, like, it's not letting me progress in my re relationship with my sister, you know. And, like, uh, you know, I try, you know, and I be there for her, you know. And, I'm, and, and a lot of the times it's, like, it took me, like, years and years to where we, like, maybe three years before we were able to even talk on a civilized level. And that was just from me, you know, because I did a lot of damage, especially when I was using, too, you know, uh, tearing the house up, you know, just the way that I was, you know, it's, like, seeing me, you know, just selling drugs out the house, you know, getting the house raided, you know, I took her through a lot of shit too, you know, and I had to just stay clean for a while, you know, I didn't even try to 
address it. I didn't try to do anything. I just stayed clean, you know, and, and it got better, you know, and it, and even to this day, it's like, even though, you know, it's like a, through working steps and stuff, it's getting better, you know, it's like where I, I loaned her money like a month ago, you know, and she paid me back, you know, but it wasn't the fact of loaning the money. It's the fact that like, just being there, you know, just being there and doing what I have to do, you know, uh, and doing right as I can by her, you know, it's like her, I guess, what do you call that, like, not capitalism, like her shallowness kills me, you know, and her step, my stepdad's just like that too, like, and sometimes, like, lately, because my mom is like the type of person where she's always, my like, my whole life, she's like, my stepfather used to pay the rent, she used to, you know, take care of everything else, you know, she used to, any extras that I ever got, it was her, you know, any time that I used to get sneakers or, you know, he used to, you know, always want to take me to Kmart, get them plastic joints, whatever, when I was a kid, and I had shit about that, you know, it's like, all the kids be making fun of me and shit, I was like, nah, I ain't going to the store with his ass, you know, like, but, uh, you know, like, my sister lately has been, like, she has a, she just got a job, she just graduated college, you know, top whatever she got a job with a pharmaceutical company making like forty five thousand dollars a year all expenses and all this and she's addicted to like monetary shit you know and she and my mom is barely struggling by and she's asking my mom for money for a handbag or you know and, and my mom's the type of person where she'll give her or less for a handbag or some shit like that and i'm just like you know and i i seriously have a grudge against her for that shit and i'm like you know I'm really getting pissed off over it just because it's the fact is like, how can you just like see my mother struggle, you know, paycheck to paycheck to paycheck and then ask her for something like that, you know, and I seriously, you know, and, and I work steps and I do, you, you know, that's why I just haven't been able to like get there. Like I went up there at Easter and everything was cool and everything, but I didn't really sit, you know, I know what I need to do, I know I need to, like, take her aside and be like, listen, you know, don't ask her for nothing else, you know, if you need anything, I guess I would have to do that, but it's like, you know, it's just painful that she would, like, and it, and what somebody said to me was, like, she can't get the emotional bond that me and my mom has, so she tries to take what she can, which is the money, you know, and it's, like, a crazy-ass situation to me, you know, and and, like, like, that grudge is like, you know, it's like she's my sister and I've always been raised. Even though, like, she's only half my sister, you know, in, like, blood-wise. I've been raised with her my whole life and I love her like a sister. But it's like, why would you treat my mother like that? You know, it's like, we brother and sister, but this is my mother. You know what I mean? It comes down to that. But it's like, to an extent, my mom's going to still do it and she's going to still do her stuff. So, you know, I have to give her her process, you know, and when I started to look at it, I realized, like, you did the same shit when you were using, you know, and and, and I realized that in a, in a lot of ways that grudge goes back to me, it's like that I used to be a leech, you know, it's like when by the time I was 21, you know, until the time I got clean, you know, I never had cigarettes, you know, I never had money, you know, the only time I ever had a job was when my Mother would drag me out of work, take me to clean houses with her and stuff like that. Like, I was a straight bum, you know. And when I see, like, someone leeching on my mom again, it, would, like, just brings me back to where I was, you know. And it's like, damn, you know, it's like, that's where I was, you know. And uh I guess she's going to have to work through her process with that, you know. And it's like, that and like another grudge that I recently have is like with my job, you know, it's like my job is like, you know, I've been working like now I keep cutting my hours down because I don't want to be there, you know, I've been working at a Joe job for like six, seven years, you know, I like it. I really like interacting with the customers, you know, recently I've started to do some more stuff that's like more on a professional job level, you know, like web design and stuff like that. But, you know, I work at a coffee house and, like, just the way, like, it's like I've been running basically the whole show for a long time. And it's like, but they won't, you know, I mean, there's only one person above me, which is the owner. But at the same time, what what pisses me off is, like, he's an absentee boss. 
And the last owner was an absentee boss. And they leave me like, okay, take care of this, right? But at the same time, they don't give me the amount of control that I need to. And the areas that I don't handle are the ones that get fucked up, you know? And like, you know, we do events, we lose money on the events. And I'm like, fuck, you know, I'm working so hard to keep keep money flowing in, you know, thinking of new ways to market and do all this kind of stuff for you just to piss it away, you know, and I got a grudge against my boss like that. It's just like, you know, and and I finally told him, like, listen, you know, because I had blown up at the guys that were running the event, you know, during one of the events. And my boss was like, oh, oh, yeah, so, but it's crazy because he knows the way that I feel and he understands what's going on, but he doesn't change it because he don't want to have to deal with it, you know, um, and it's amazing, it's like that I, you know, it's like I don't know, like I'm in that position where, okay, you've been doing this for a long time, okay, that you've been doing this for a long time, and like, you know, it's just frustrating that, you know, you like what you do, but it's like you're stuck under a management that's not there, and you're running certain things, the things that you don't have control of are getting fucked up, and then I'm the one that people come to, like the customers and different, and I have to like clean up. You know, I'm tired of sweeping up after my boss's ass, you know, and he's the one making the money, you know. I'm coming behind cleaning up his messes and he's making the money. And that's, you know, and I seriously got a grudge and a resentment against that man for that, you know, and, it, and I generally think he's a decent person, you know, he's all, all right, you know, he just started to get us benefits, which is good, you know, starting in May. But it just seems like that, you know, like I, I just don't know what to do, you know, because I'm in that position where he won't take care of it, you know, and right now I'm not in the position to leave, so I'm just stuck there, you know. And it takes all that I can do, you know, on a, on a daily basis. You know, I'm the type person where I pray at 6 in the morning, I start working real early. By 10 o'clock, I'm off the ringer, you know, yelling, hollering, you know, like, boom, boom, you do that, you know, like, just crazy. Like, I, I get like that a lot of days. And a lot of days, you know, what I've learned is to go back to my basics, you know, like go in the bathroom and pray, you know, uh, read the just for the day or, you know, and a lot of days I have to recenter myself, you know. Uh, what I've realized is like that a grudge is definitely, you know, it could probably back you into a corner that you couldn't get out clean if you like took it there, you know. But what I realize that if you stay clean, no matter what your issues or no matter what kind of things that you have that's bothering you, you know, that if you stay clean that you can work on them tomorrow and that you can get through them, you know, because I've seen people, you know, have major issues with their family. I've seen them work through it. So if they they could do it, I could do it too. And and that's what this program is about. It's like one addict helping another. And uh with that, that's all I have to share. Yeah. Speaker is uh, Derek A. from North. Yeah. I'm a recovering drug addict. My name is Derek. Hey, Derek. I'd like to thank the Capital Area Convention for taking risks with an addict like me. Um, and recovery is a gift. And I truly believe that. You know what I'm saying? Hey, you're talking about um, grudge is a happy, heavy thing to carry, right? I had a grudge at a very young age, right? I'm going to take y'all through a little story. On life, you know what I'm saying? See, my 12 step tell every act has you way of carrying the message, you know what I'm saying, right? And tell your own story, right? I'm talking about originally out of Brooklyn, uh, Brownsville, which is Brooklyn, New York, you know what I'm saying, right? And like, but being I had a father who was a productive member of society, my father was in the Navy, right? And my mother grew up in the projects her whole life, so she said when she had her kids, she wanted better for her kids, right? So what happened was, my father was in the Navy, and when it was time for him to retire, he retired in Northern California, in the predominantly white neighborhood. And that's where I grew grew up, right? And that's when the grudges started, you know what I'm saying, right? And I'm talking about, like, getting disconnected at a very young age, trying to find yourself, you know what I'm saying? And I'm talking about, I talked to my cousins in, them, in New York, right? And they talking about doing one thing, and then I'm on the West Coast doing something totally different, you know what I'm saying, right? And I just couldn't find, I couldn't find myself, so I tried to find something that would take me outside myself. My brother came on with some reefer one day. He said, yo, Jay, man, try this, you know what I'm saying? 
He showed me how to smoke my first joint. And I fell in love with my first joint because it took me outside myself, right? And I always, I went through like 19 years trying to find that feeling again. Just couldn't find them, saying. I'm talking my life. I'm not going to be blaming my disease on my parents, right? I'm not going to blame it on people, places, and things. I must take responsibility for myself, you know right? But but at a young age, I didn't know that, right? So I did a whole lot of things to escape myself, man. I'm talking about using drugs at, at a very young age, right? And I'm talking about just doing it just to try to find myself, you know what I'm saying? And, like, and what happened was when I was young coming up, you know what I'm saying, all my friends were doing one thing, and I was doing something totally different, you know what I'm saying? Let me, let me slow down. A grudge is a heavy thing to carry. See, I don't go on my own thinking, right? I went and called another experienced woman and asked him, yeah, what's your definition of grudge, you know what I'm saying? And she said, I carry it like a, like a resentment, you know what I'm saying, right? So I'm running with that, you know what I'm saying? And we're talking about a grudge. It's a heavy thing to carry. I carried that for a lot of years, man. I always wanted to be somebody other than who I really was, right? And I would go to different neighborhoods, and I would tell cats I'm from a place other than where I was, you know what I'm saying, right? You know, being I'm really from Brooklyn, but I really wasn't growing up in Brooklyn, you know what I'm saying? See, my, my life started on the West Coast, where I started learning things out there, right? And I'm talking about doing anything to be other than who I was, you know what I'm saying? And what I'm talking about, and when I smoked reefer, it took me outside myself, man. And when I, went, I went like 19 years trying to escape me, right? And I'm talking about growing up out there, you know what I'm saying? Check this out. I grew up good. I didn't grow up having to worry about eating no food. I didn't have to worry about clothing, you know what I'm saying? Because my father was productive, you know what I'm saying, right? You know, there was always meals at the table, right? So that wasn't enough, though. I still needed something that would make me feel whole again. And I thought I would find it, you know what I'm saying? And I'm talking about, man, from that very young age, man, I'm talking about how the degrees progress at a young age, man. I started smoking reefer, right? Drinking beer, you know, sniffing um, coke, you know what I'm saying, right? You know, sniffing acid, doing acid, you know what I'm saying? I did a whole lot of different drugs, different combinations of drugs to try to take them outside myself, you know what I'm saying? And all the time I'm using drugs, I started doing things that addicts, addicts do. I started stealing stuff at a very young age, you know what I'm saying? All my youth was in and out the youth house. And every time I got locked up, the council said, Yo, Jake, if you don't change, you don't graduate to the prison system, right? And I said, no, not me. I'm a little different, you know what I'm saying, right? Because what I would do when I get locked up, when I get locked up, I go hang out with other people, right? And we get the master plan together till we hit the street, how we're going to flip it, do it better this time, right? And I never could figure it out until I got here 19 years later by the saying he's doing the same thing, expecting different results. I never knew that shit, man. I, I always get knocked off, you know what I'm saying? I said, damn, if I went down the other block as opposed to this block, she would have been all right, you know what I'm saying, right? I couldn't figure it out until I got here, man. And, I, man, I had grudges over, over my parents for taking us, having us grow up in that neighborhood as opposed to growing up in Brownsville where my family was, you know what I'm saying? Check this out. Man, I'm talking my life is painful growing up, man. You know, I ain't have a whole bunch of responsibilities. Don't think I had it. My responsibility was to go to school, get an education, right? I couldn't do that shit, though. I couldn't follow a super program <laughs> at a young age, you know what I'm saying? You know what? How I identified, I identified with Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz, right? Every time she got off the yellow brick road, she called drama, you know what I'm saying, right? And that's how my life was, you know what I'm saying, at a young age, man. I couldn't stay on the yellow brick road, man. I couldn't follow simple directions, you know what I'm saying, right? I was always trying to escape reality, you know what I'm saying? I tried to find it with people, places, and things. I started hanging out with cats, like I said, getting high, pulling B&Es, you know what I'm saying, right? Pulling stick-ups and shit. That wasn't me, right? But I was trying to find myself, man. And I'm talking about, like, growing up was painful, man. And I made a whole lot of bad choices when I was young. I'm going to check this out. I was young. I was watching news one time, and a plane crashed, right? And the people in the news said, like, 400, 200, 300 people died on the plane crash, right? And I started crying. My father came from the back. He said, what's the matter? I said, the plane crashed, and all the people died, right? He said, man, man up. You know what I'm saying, right? So he taught me at a young age to take your feelings on the ground. Don't let nobody see your real emotions, you know what I'm saying, right? So I'm saying, damn, this is how I got to go through life, you know what I'm saying, right? And I'm talking about my having grudges at a young age, man. I couldn't get nothing right, you know what I'm saying, right? And I'm talking about trying to find it through different combinations of drugs, you know what I'm saying, right? And, you know, but, and I did conventions before, right? You know, I got caught at the last moment, you know what I'm saying? But they tell me never say no to narcotics now, and I do got a message to give you all, right? We're talking about um, a grudge is terrible thing to carry, you know what I'm saying, because it's a heavy thing to carry. The only person that feels is me. Y'all don't know I got a grudge with you, you know what I'm saying? But I'm, uh, it's like peeing on myself. I'm the only person that feels it, you know what I'm saying, right? 
And I'm talking about what helped me what helped me deal with my grudges is the step work. You know what I'm saying? The first step taught me about acceptance. If I can get with acceptance, whatever I got a grudge with, things usually work itself out. You know what I'm saying? But when I ain't got no acceptance with it, I'm only I'm all unmanageable now. You know what I'm saying right? And that's why they talk about the answers is truly in the steps. You know what I'm saying right? I didn't come to Nakasan to do no steps. I came because I had a drug problem. I had a major drug problem, and I want to learn how to control this. You know what I'm saying? You know. But y'all told me your drugs is a symptom of my disease. My disease is much bigger than the drugs, man. I went to a meeting. They picked up a piece of paper. They said, here's the drugs. They tear it off the corner, and they said, here's your problem. And how do I address my problem? I address it with, the, with a narcotics anonymous sponsor and doing some step work, you know what I'm saying? Because the steps help me get outside myself. They help me. The steps keep me from committing suicide, and the just help me keep me from committing homicide, you know what I'm saying, right? So I got to come in here, and I got to get with the, with the we of narcotics now, you know what I'm saying, right? And I'm talking about, man, I came in, and I learned how to be free, man. So we talking about grudges, you know what I'm saying? And I learned how to deal with that, man. You know what I'm saying? How I get in with grudges, like I said, is acceptance and surrender, man. You know, and it don't always come easy, man, because my disease is cunning, baffling, and insidious, you know what I'm saying? A lot of times I can't see my disease coming, you know what I'm saying, right? And I'm talking about the grudges started, too, at a young age. I grew up happy. Joyce and free, man. You know, I'm talking about, I grew up in a um, four-bedroom house, right? Two parents, you know what I'm saying? And, like, we was living like the Brady Bunch life, you know what I'm saying, right? And, like, but what happened was my mother and father started going through their things, and, and they broke up and went through their divorce, you know what I'm saying? That's when shit went, went haywire, right? So now, check this out. I'm in Northern California, right? Now I got to come back to Brownsville, New York, right? Age 13, entering high school, you know what I'm saying, right? Now I got to ante up, right? Now I'm in Brooklyn, right? Coming from, we talking about the suburbs in Northern California to the projects in Brooklyn, New York, you know what I'm saying, right? Which is a culture shock, you know what I'm saying, right? And I'm trying to find myself in this drama, you know what I'm saying, right? Only thing going for me, I had an uncle who grew up, grew up there his whole life, you know what I'm saying, right? So when I got to Brooklyn, you know what I'm saying? He said, Derek, look, this is Brownville, right? We never run and we never will, you know what I'm saying, right? And that's what you got to internalize in your soul because that's how we living in here, you know what I'm saying, right? So I had to ante up at a young age, man, you know what I'm saying? And I got on the block, man, and we smoking blunts and shit, you know what I'm saying, right? And they said, yo, this how you do it, get the uh, White House cigar, you know what I'm saying? Show me how I wrote my first blunt, you know what I'm saying, right? You know, and that's when the madness started, man. I'm talking about going uptown, snatching gold chains, you know what I'm saying, right? I'm talking about they introduced me to the lifestyle that I really wasn't accustomed to, but I got in and I learned how to do what I had to do at a young age, man. And guess what? I always had that that drug to take me outside myself. And I was see, I was very shaky and insecure at the time when I was doing all this shit, right? But I had to wear that mask because you can't let nobody see you sweat. You know what I'm saying, right? All this is that age, like I said, man, like 15, 16, man. You know, like thug training, man. Ante up, man. So I'm, I'm learning the drugs real slick. You know what I'm saying, right? And guess what? See, one thing about addicts, addicts could adapt to any environment, you know what I'm saying, right? And we learn what to do, what we got to do real smooth, you know what I'm saying, right? So I adapted to all that, man, and I started liking that shit, you know what I'm saying? I like seeing fear on people's faces and shit, you know what I'm saying? We're about to do some foul stuff, you know what I'm saying, right? I'm talking about like doing that type of stuff, you know what I'm saying, right? Hurting cash, you know what I'm saying, and okay with it, you know what I'm saying, right? You know, I'm talking about getting planted. I'm talking about, man, have, having a grudge with life, you know what I'm saying, right? You know, and I'm talking about, man, years later, man, understanding, right, that life didn't do nothing to me. I did everything to life, you know what I'm saying, for my lack my um, lack of self-acceptance, you know what I'm saying, right? But I'm talking about coming into this process, man, and learning how to surrender, man, you know what I'm saying? I'm talking about, like, grudges, man. Y'all don't thank God for not causing us, man. I came here, y'all told me you're Derek, man. We do this shit one day at a time, man. You know what I'm saying? We're going to go through issues in narcotics numbers. It's not a problem. It's just an issue. You know what I'm saying? It's just how I deal with it. You know what I'm saying? Right? And I'm talking about get, get loving, caring people who care about you want to help you in recovery. You know what I'm saying? Right? And like, that was the best thing ever happened to me. You know what I'm saying? Because like, I, left, I left out a whole lot of stuff in my in my journey to where I'm at now. Right? You know? But um, it's all right. You know what I'm saying? I'm talking about, man, the grudges. I, I don't carry grudges too, too deep nowadays. You know what I'm saying? You know, because I, I, I understand about how I'm the only one that suffers when I'm carrying them, you know what I'm saying, right? You know, and um, and that comes from hearing the experience people tell me about this, you know what I'm saying, right? I didn't know nothing about recovery before I came here. 
But I got with people who did, you know what I'm saying, right? They got me up under their wings, you know what I'm saying, and they started showing me, you know what I'm saying, right? Yeah, I told them I, only, I can't grasp a new idea on a closed mind, so open them must be made somewhere, you know what I'm saying? So I came back and I did a whole lot of listening, you know what I'm saying, right? You know, they told me you got to listen to learn and learn to listen. You got to get a message first before you be a messenger carrier, you know what I'm saying, right? You know, I'm talking about, man, I love my you know what I'm saying? I wouldn't trade this thing for nothing in the world. You know, I'm talking about, man, mm. Mm-mm-mm. Coming back, man. You know, I'm trying to tell y'all, man, that shit was painful for me growing up, right? And I'm talking about, but guess what? Coming to Narcos, I hear a whole lot of us had pain growing up, you know what I'm saying? So it ain't no big difference, you know what I'm saying? I'm talking about, like, I'm talking about when I came back from the West Coast to New York and I touched down in Brownsville, right? I had on some Adidas, right? And the whole product looked at my Adidas and shit, right? And they said, Derek, um, we thought that you're supposed to be leather. Right? I had some corduroy Adidas some shit, right? And the whole block sit out there the whole night capping on my shoes and shit. On my whole dress code period, I'm saying, right? So what happened was, I knew I had to get off the block. So I went upstairs, went in the room, told my uncle, man, I ain't going outside no more. He said, why? I said, because I got corduroy Adidas and shit, right? And the whole block is clowning this shit, right? So my uncle said, go in, go in my room, get my um, kicks and shit, right? Cause my uncle had all the colors, you know what I'm saying? Red, green. You know, with the fat, with the fat shoelaces. That was back then, you know what I'm saying? And like, I grabbed one of those Adidas, put it on, had the leaves, just iron the leaves up and shit, you know what I'm saying? Hit the block, you know what I'm saying? Now I'm a regular, you know what I'm saying, right? So, so now the niggas ain't capping on me no more and shit, right? So I felt, now I got, now I know what I gotta do to fit in, you know what I'm saying? Right? So that's when I started wearing the proper dress code, you know what I'm saying? All different color shoes, you know what I'm saying? Talking about the, the Pumas, you know what I'm saying? T- still told, um, shell told Adidas and shit, you know I'm saying? And I learned how to fit in, you know I'm saying, right? And I'm talking about, what I'm talking about, finding out that I really didn't have a resentment with you. The resentment really started with me through my lack of self acceptance, you know I'm saying, right? But when I was able to accept my reality and life just the way it was, everything worked out a whole, whole lot better, man. You know? And I'm talking about, man, I didn't learn none of this until coming to rooms in our college, you know what I'm saying? I came here because I thought I had a drug problem, but I finally found out I had a living problem. And, you dis- and I, when y'all would teach me how to deal with life on life terms and situations and not use no narcotics, I'm saying, you know, and I'm talking about, man, life has become pain wonderful, man. I'm talking about going, I said I left a whole lot of shit out of my store, like go getting sent to prison and shit, I'm saying, by acting on my attitudes, my ideas, and my behavior, like doing stuff that wasn't really me, catching the salt, salt with deadly weapons and shit, I'm saying, right, getting incarcerated, I'm saying, learning a whole different kind of trade in the prison system and shit, I'm saying, right. You know, coming back to the streets, you know what I'm saying? Not once asked myself, could drugs be the problem? So after being locked up, hitting the streets, you know what I'm saying? I was doing the same shit I was doing in less than 30 days that got me sent to prison. And the way I was living, I was going to go back, you know what I'm saying? But God intervened. God stepped into the way and said, yo, Jack, I got your son. I got something better for you, you know what I'm saying? And he sent me to the rooms of narcotics and was, man. And I got into the rooms of N.A., and I sat back and I heard other people tell their stories that I could identify with. People doing the same shit I was doing, you know what I'm saying? And they talk about they're not doing this shit no more. They live in a different life, you know what I'm saying? And if you want what we have to offer and they're willing to make an effort, we can show you how to get it, you know what I'm saying? So I sat back and I started getting with the winners, man. And in the rooms, we got a whole lot of winners. But guess what? You got to sit back and find out who they are. You know what I'm saying? You know, that process, that process comes by making 90 meetings in 90 days. Sit back, listen and learn and learn to listen, man. And that's what I started doing, man. And uh, I started getting with the winners, you know what I'm saying? And they started showing me to do the right thing for the right reason, man. You know, they told me, Dad, you're doing a good job staying clean, but guess what? Your life's still the same. Mm-hmm. Only thing different is you ain't getting high, right? He said, why don't you try to do what productive members of society do, you know what I'm saying? Like get a job, you know what I'm saying, right? Yes. You know? <laughs> that shit just never came to me, get a job. Why get a job like Clinton City Welfare, you know what I'm saying, right? And B.I. is chill on the block with the rest of the crew and shit, you know what I'm saying? He said, yeah, we ain't living like that, man. Let's go get a damn job, right? So I went out there. I went to Sea Caucus, you know what I'm saying? Went to Roy Rogers, age 26, grown-ass man, right? I talked with the manager, man, to say, we'll give you a shot. I told the manager, hold up one second. I'm going to call my sponsor response. They want to give me a job at Roy Rogers, but I don't think I should take this job, right? And he asked me, why not? Because I said, I'm too damn grown to be flipping burgers at Roy Rogers, right? And my sponsor said, Dick, when you was incarcerated, how much was they paying you when you was locked up? <laughs> and I said, thanks for sharing, I'm saying, right? 
And I took that job, man, and I started working at Roy Rogers, flipping burgers, at a grown, talking about a grown cat, flipping burgers, right? The ladies come through the line and shit. Oh, sir, can I get some hot fries? I'm ready to, I'm ready to flip, you know what I'm saying? Because the fries just came up, right? She wants some hot fries, right? So I say, all right, man. So I can get up some fries, make some more hot ones and shit, you know what I'm saying, right? I'm talking about practicing, checking my attitude, my ideas, my behavior, because I'm ready to black out, you know what I'm saying, right? I'm talking about. That was the best thing my sponsor told me to do was go ahead and get a damn job and live like normal people do. And that started telling me how to deal with my disease, man, you know. And I'm talking about, man, thank God for the rooms and the people inside the rooms, right. And through that one job, right, I, heard, I came here and I was seeing y'all sharing from the floor about y'all going on vacation. Y'all talking about the income tax, the income tax money's coming through, right? And y'all about to bounce out of town and, and stuff, right? So I'm saying to myself, damn, I ain't never got no income tax a day in my life, I'm saying. No, that's pathetic, though. Age 26, no income tax return a day in your life? Come on, right? So, but I heard y'all talking about that stuff, right? And my sponsor said, Dad, those are some of the gifts you get by staying clean and going to work and being a productive member of society, right? So I'm on my job at Roy Rogers, y'all, working for a whole year. And now I'm eligible for income tax, right? <laughs> so I'm sitting back and shit, right? So I went down to the travel agency, right? Got me a bunch of whole bunch of brochures and shit, you know what I'm saying, right? I said, where do I want to go? Hawaii, you know what I'm saying, right? The Bahamas, you know what I'm saying, right? I'm like all gassed up with this, right? So I filed my little income tax return and shit, right? And I was happy, but I was disappointed, right? I was happy because I was getting returned. But I was disappointed because there wasn't enough money for me to go on no damn trips <laughs> to no Hawaii or no shit like that, right? It was just enough for me to get a few pair of pants, right? Some tennis shoes to keep that shit local, you know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> so I called my sponsor and said, your sponsor, man, you know, I'll give him income tax and everything is good with that, you know what I'm saying? But um, it's not enough money for me to go to, on no vacation to no damn Hawaii, no shit like that, right? And he said, you know why that was? I said, why? He said, because the type of work you do, right? He said, what you got to do is go back to school, learn a trade, right? And then that give you more money, and then you get more, get more things, right? So I went back to school. I learned to trade, started messing with cars and stuff, I'm saying, right? Did that for a whole year. Got qualified to do what I got to do, right? Got a job and went back to work, I'm saying, right? Now I'm building up a prudent reserve, right? Stacking my chips and shit, you know what I'm saying? And I'm talking my life. My money started getting kind of deep, right? I said, sponsor. I called my sponsor. Sponsor, what? He said, what? I said, you know what? I just looked at my bank account, right? If I want to go to Hawaii or Bahamas, I got enough cake to do that shit right now, you know what I'm saying, right? I ain't got to wait for no income tax return, you know what I'm saying? He said, yeah, and that comes from you getting that better job, paying more money, you know what I'm saying, right? He said, this thing is about living life on life terms as other people do, man. Don't stay stuck on stupid, you know what I'm saying? You got to go out there and do some things, you know what I'm saying? Because I'm that cat that sit back in the meeting and see other people drive up a nice car, and stop character his ass. And this nigga think he all that, right? No, it's not he think that. I think that, you know what I'm saying? You know, and they started to tell me put my thing in proper perspective, you know what I'm saying, right? You know, and that helped me start dealing with that, man. They helped me deal with the grudges, man. I'm going to have grudges with you because you're doing the right thing for the right reason, man. You know, you calling your sponsor every day. You're doing the step work, you know what I'm saying? How the hell this cat sharing on this step when I got here before him, you know what I'm saying? Because he came in and doing the work, you know what I'm saying, right? You can't knock nobody for coming here and wanting to get better, right? I heard a tape with a guy, the guy asked me, um, down the tape said, um, how, the sponsor asked the sponsor, how soon do you want to get better, you know what I'm saying, right? He said immediately, I'm saying, so we're going to go to do the step work right now, you know what I'm saying? Area I come from, we don't make, we don't have you wait no 60, 90 a year to do no step work. You come in, you ready for recovery, we put you to work, you know what I'm saying, right? And that's how he did me, man. And I thank God for that, man, because he helped me deal with my grudges, man. Grudge is like a resentment, man. And they help me deal with that shit. And that shit come from lack of acceptance, you know what I'm saying? When I can accept whatever's going on, I'm all right with it, you know what I'm saying? I should say I deal with it a whole lot better, you know what I'm saying? I may not be all right with it, but it's okay, you know what I'm saying, right? You know, I'm talking about, man, thank God for this 12 step process, you know what I'm saying, right? You know, I'm talking about, man, we come from, um, we come from up north, the greater Newark area, right? And we go, we do traveling for our recovery, man. We don't care where we got to go for this message, you know what I'm saying, right? We're talking about getting away for the whole weekend, you know what I'm saying, sitting back, hearing other people share their experience with the hope, knowing that we ain't got it locked down in our area, you know what I'm saying, right? We got to go outside our area and talk about the broader the, um, the broader the base, the higher the freedom, right? So what I do, I go to another area, and I walk around with, with meat lists with the back of the head and have 
other people sign the name and numbers, you know what I'm saying, right? And I give them a call every now and then. I'm not gonna call you every week, no shit like that. But you know what I'm saying? Everything I'll check in with you, see how you doing the shit, you know what I'm saying, right? And I'm talking about, man, recovery's on the game of town, you know what I'm saying, right? I went from a loner to a member, you know what I'm saying, right? I'm that cat now. Would do whatever I gotta do to stay clean and help another addict stay clean, man. I'm talking about because they did that thing for me, man. You know, I'm talking about, man, it's the only game in town, man. You know, so I'm talking about the step work, how me deal with the grudges at the world, man. Today, I ain't got grudges at my parents for being the best parents they could be. You know, my mother and father didn't think when they was moving us from New York to the white neighborhood that it was gonna cause any harm. They thought they were doing the right thing, and that's what we did in America, you know what I'm saying? And, um, I'm thank God that's how it went down. I'm glad I lived my life just the way it was. For every experience I went through, them saying right, I wouldn't take nothing back. Them saying right, because that all them experiences are the person that's in front of you now, man. And I used to have a cat. I used to not not accept myself for who I was, but today I accept myself for who I am. I'm saying right. Either you like it or you don't. I'm saying, but I'm okay with me. I'm saying, and that's what the steps do for you, man. I harmed a whole lot of people out there when I was using. I'm talking about harming cats. I'm saying right. You know, and they talking about it's okay, man. You know what I'm saying? Some people can make amends to, and sometimes it may be it's best not to make amends to them. You know what I'm saying? And just not do that shit no more. You know what I'm saying, right? You know, and that's why sponsorships the heartbeat of this program, man. You learn what to do and what not to do. You know what I'm saying, right? And um, I'm just glad this Aaron took a risk with the addict like me. You know what I'm saying? I ain't having time to warm up, give y'all no script. You know what I'm saying, right? You know, but I like it like that. When I walk through the door and say, Yo, Jay, look. Speaker ain't sure we need you, you know what I'm saying, right? Could you step in, you know what I'm saying? One thing I never say is no to narcotics you know what I'm saying? Because they didn't say no to me when I first got here. Somebody carried that message to me when I first got here. And, and they're talking about, when you come to N.A., find one person that you can tell everything to. You know what I'm saying? Because sometimes we can't tell me to drop everything on the group, you know what I'm saying? But find one person you tell everything to. Because, see, when you start sharing your disease with other people, you get free, man. And then you get choices. After that, you get choices on what you want to do, man. You know, I'm talking about like grudges that grudges is a heavy thing to carry. Like I'm saying, if you get to this narcotics anonymous program and you start working the steps, you hear early recovery steps is the answer. Right? Answer to what? Answer to your questions. Living on life on life terms, I'm saying, right? Man, this is the only thing in town, man. I wouldn't trade this thing for nothing in the world, I'm saying, right? This thing has taught me how to be patient and tolerant of other people, I'm saying, right? I was that one addict sitting in the back. And you come to knockouts now and you do something other than what we doing here, I'm the first one jumping up, hollering. That ain't how we do that shit in here, man. Take that shit to the street, right? But that ain't my place. Because the first thing I'm talking about, I'm powerless, I'm saying. I'm talking about, man, this thing is, I'm talking about understanding rather than being understood, you know what I'm saying, right? You know, how it's been in the media, them people come in and they talk about how they cross addicted, you know what I'm saying? How they alcoholic and addicts, you know what I'm saying, right? And in they, we just one disease with many symptoms, you know what I'm saying? So we let's ask you to identify yourself as an addict, and that cancels everything else that you want to put into it, you know what I'm saying, right? You know, but I was unpatient with that, you know what I'm saying? But as I kept coming, you know what I'm saying, right? And I under, now it's better I understand rather than be understood, you know what I'm saying, right? So I can't play God up in this place, you know what I'm saying? I, one thing the steps have taught me is my place. And once I know my place, everything will be all right, you know what I'm saying, right? So, like I'm saying, I want to thank this air, like I'm saying, for taking a risk with an addict like me. And today, I have no grudges, you know what I'm saying, because I got acceptance for life. It's just the way it is, you know what I'm saying, right? You know, through sponsorship, through a home group, you know what I'm saying, right? You know, I use all the tools available to me, you know what I'm saying, right? You know, I'm talking about, man, mm-mm-mm. Like I said, man, we talk about NA, NA to the box in the area I come, you know what I'm saying? Because that's what we believe, NA to the box, man. There ain't no graduation in the spot, you know what I'm saying, right? You know? When you get to when you get to twelve step and you finish with twelve, you go right back to one, you know what I'm saying, right? So I hope I share something that somebody could identify with, you know what I'm saying? That's all I got. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Please help us improve our ranking so others can find us by putting a review on Stitcher, iTunes, or your favorite podcast index. Napot is ad-free thanks to the folks supporting the show with a dollar or more per month. If you enjoy listening, you can join them by going to napot.xyz and looking for the donate link. Thank you for listening. Have a great day.